gives life to my soul. Help me remember that you're in control. Cause when you speak, I feel my heart burning. Teach my soul to be always listen. a light to my path, help me remember you're the first to land, and you are the beautiful one, whenever I see Search out your heart for all my days. And Lord, I need you in my life. And nothing else can satisfy. made for this discovery now that I know I was made for this discovery this discovery this discovery this discovery This discovery From the moment that you spoke life Time and space within its course. As your hand stretched out from heaven's like a curtain, every living thing you were brought forth. And all of creation sings your song. The stars in the oceans join as one, proclaiming the glory of the sun forevermore. Good morning, community. It's good to see you guys. Why don't you guys get up on your feet? Is anybody excited to worship the Lord this morning? Yeah, amen. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of all glory and all honor. Sing them all back, sing them all back. Let's get those hands together. Come on. Life and eternal spark, I call you healer. Cause you can mend any broken heart, I call you faithful father. 
Cause you finished everything you start My soul was made To restart Come on, every voice we sing I know you by a thousand days And you deserve every single one You've given me a million ways To be amazed at what you've done And I am lost in wonder that all you do I know you by a thousand names And I'll sing them back to you, yeah I'll sing them all back Let's get those hands together, come on Your love is boundless Beyond what I could dream Your grace is patient Never giving up on me I call you bondage breaker Cause you're handing out the prison keys My soul was made To be free Anybody free this morning? We see I know you by a thousand names You deserve every single one You've given me a million ways To be amazed what you've done and I am lost in wonder at all you do. I know you by a thousand days and I'll sing them back, gonna sing them back to you. Come on, let's declare who he is. You are rock of ages, you're the great I am. You are king forever, the beginning and the end. You are Lord and servant, you're the son of man. You're the line of Judah, you're the risen lamb. You're the second Adam here to lead us home. You are Yahweh's glory now, revealed in flesh and bone. You are ocean water. You will make a way. You are tempted feeder. You have risen from the grave. You are. Jake and the high school director here at Community and I got to say we are so excited to be worshiping with all of you guys today. Just a few things. Hey, if you are new, what we want you to do right after this service to go ahead right outside our lobby doors to our new here cart. We got a special gift there just for you as well as setting up an opportunity for us to get to know you as a person as well as for you to get to know who we are 
as a church. And the best way to follow up on those conversations is to follow us on our social media. We got our Instagram, our Facebook, or if you scan the QR code that's on the screen, that's gonna take you to our community app. We're gonna be able to see all the events that I'm gonna be talking about, as well as to be RSVPing and get more details for those. The first thing, if you are new, maybe this is your first week or second week back from our Easter service. Raise your hand if you went to our Easter services. There you go, come on, those, they're such a fun time. If it is your first or second week back, the next step for you to get deeper into this church is to go to our next step meetup. That's gonna be May 5th on that Sunday at our nine o'clock service. You're gonna be able to learn from me, Pastor Donnie, Pastor Joe, Pastor John, who we are as a church. What do we believe as a church? What are ways that you, as a believer, can get connected to us, whether that's through small groups or through serving, which Pastor John will be talking about in a little bit after his message. Uh, the next thing is, ladies, what holiday do we have coming up in a few weeks? Or maybe, husbands, what, what uh, <laughs> fathers, what holiday do we have coming up in a few weeks? We got, we got Mother's Day, so do not forget that. Put that in your calendars. But hey, what we do have on those services coming on Mother's Day weekend, that 8th or that 9th and 12th, is we have our child dedication. So if you are a family that wants to dedicate your toddler or your infant, that is what you're gonna wanna do. But we have a class on April 28th on the nine o'clock service for you guys to get some more information and items to know what you wanna do on those services. We're doing dedications on the Thursday night service and on the services for that Sunday morning. So make sure you guys RSVP for that on the app. And then lastly, for those of you guys who give, whether that's through push pay online or through the offering boxes here at the church, thank you guys. I gotta say, for our middle school and high school camp fundraiser last week, you guys helped us raise over $1,000 to help kids go to camp. So give it up for you guys for doing that for us. Thank you. Uh, there's gonna be many kids who are deeply influenced by that, and hopefully some may come to faith at that camp. So we're really excited for that. Thank you. But with that, guys, let's all join together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this opportunity today to worship you for who you are, what you've done for us in our lives through your son, Jesus. Lord, through worship, through communion, through John's message, Lord, let us have open ears, open hearts, open minds to what you have for us this morning, Lord. We thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand back up and worship. So community, this next song, we're told about how God raised the bones and put flesh back on them talks about in this song we're going to sing there's another miracle here in this room so join me okay Saturday was silent surely it was through since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. something new you're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon yeah. resurrection power runs in my veins too i believe in another miracle here in this room this is the sound of the dry bones rattling Make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the travel. How are we feeling this morning, community? Let's 
impossible. We serve a God who takes the impossible and makes it possible. We serve a God who takes dead bones, raises dead things to life. Would you lift your hands with me in this room as we declare this? Come on. Land to deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just as the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah is there. Just as full at the 1045 as it was for the 9, so that's super exciting. So, you guys probably know, but we're in a new series. It's called New Life Even When It Hurts. And in this series, we're going to be tackling, the pastors are going to be tackling some really tough issues. Things like anxiety and depression, suicide and self-harm, that's just a few. There's a song that I've been singing for a while, and I told Justin, I said, I think it's really important that we introduce this song during this series. Because for me, when I sing this song, it reminds me of my own testimony. So, from the time that I was 16 to 20, so for four years, I struggled with a severe eating disorder. And I just kept dropping weight and I got down to 85 pounds. And I'm 5'5". Five five. So I was hardly there. And my parents were trying everything they possibly could to help me. They took me to doctors. They took me to therapists. They took me to dietitians. We read all the books. And absolutely nothing was working. And it got to the point where the doctor said I was going to die if things didn't change. So that made me finally go to God and ask God for the healing. Four years of trying everything that the world would tell you to try, and I didn't go to God. I don't know if I didn't believe that he could heal me, seemed impossible for him to heal my broken mind that was telling me these things. But within a month of me finally praying to God and asking him to heal me, I finally started gaining weight. I was getting healthy again. It was an absolute miracle. It's so fun to talk about it now because when people ask me, how did you overcome that? What book did you read? What doctor did you see? so fun to tell them it was God. No explanation. He just healed me when I finally asked. And this song says, who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. And I lived that. My favorite part of the song says, you healed my brokenness and showed me your glory. So I have songs of thanks not even angels sing. And I lived that too. 
So we're really excited to bring it to you because I know I'm not the only person who has walked through something as dark and terrible as that. I know that some of you might be walking in that valley right now, feeling hopeless, feeling depressed, but I'm here to tell you that if you turn it over to God, if you give it to God, He can heal you. He can restore anything. He can redeem absolutely anything. So we are going to sing this song out, and I just want you to hear it. I want you all to rejoice with me as we praise our Lord. the Father loves us. So we're just going to lift up His name, our Lamb of God. Lamb of God, anointed one, who was and is and is to come, seated on the throne of the Holy, Holy, righteous one, who shed His blood to prove to us the Father's love. Jesus Christ be lifted up, sing holy, holy Lamb of God, anointed one, who was and is and is to come, seated on the throne above, holy, holy, righteous one, who shed his blood, to prove to us the Father's love, Jesus Christ be lifted 
worthy when he seeks us out. We thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, meet us here today. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit and washed in His blood, and what He did for me on Calvary was more. Prophesy this over your life today. Sing this out with me. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why I trust Him. Come on, say That's it why I trust Him. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust in God, my Savior.
your trust in God, he will never fail. He will never leave you nor forsake you. It has nothing to do with how good you're able to be and everything to do with the finished, completed work of the cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we know we don't have to live in the rat race of trying to uphold the standard. We get to live accepting the mercy and the grace and the love of a heavenly father who's already paid the price for you, sending his only son. With that being said, we're going to jump into a time of communion to remember that sacrifice made for us. So we've got the elements here at the front and back of the room at the table. I'll just miss you guys now to grab those. If you're watching us at home online, be sure to grab some from that pantry. He who knew no sin became sin. Pay the price for us. Took that sin with him to the grave and put it to rest once and for all for us. So remembering the body that was broken for us, let's take the bread together. Remembering the blood that was shed, let's go ahead and take the juice. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We love you. We don't take for granted the work that's been completed on our behalf, God. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the price being paid. We thank you for loving us when we wanted nothing to do with you. So we give you all the glory and all the honor. And all God's people said, Amen, amen. So good to be together. Don't you appreciate our band and just our time of worship today? Wow. It's really cool. Uh, 
Lauren shared part of her story in each of our services. And uh, Thursday night, it just so happened, Thursday night, we were getting ready for a baptism. I was backstage. And uh, we, we started something last year where we have people sign the wall when they get baptized. So we have people, like a ton of people from last year. And then we told people, too, if, if, if that happened before last year and you didn't get a chance to do that, and you remember, it's like going back. And you, so we have people who've signed it from different years. And um, I was standing there waiting, and I'm listening to Lauren's story, and I look up, and there's Lauren's name. 2014, 10 years ago, she was baptized here. And I just, I loved hearing her story again as a part of what we're talking about. And uh, that, that was just kind of this cool little moment I wanted to pass on to you. Speaking of cool moments, we've had three more baptisms this week, and that makes 98 this year. Yeah. God is so awesome. We're getting to see the change, and uh, we're watching people like come to know Jesus and uh, that, that new life that we've been talking about uh, that we reference in 2 Corinthians 5. Like the old is gone, the new has come. It's pretty cool stuff. Well, we are in a series on, on mental health. I want to give you a heads up. Next week, I have a friend of mine, Paul Alexander, is going to be here. He's going to be speaking. He is the president of Hope International University in Fullerton, and he's also a licensed counselor. And I just felt like it would be good during this series to have somebody come out and talk while we're dealing with the heavy stuff. In fact, next week we're talking about suicide and self-harm. And so he's going to be here to help kind of guide some of our thoughts through that. I want to ask you to be praying about that. Invite your friends. Be a part of that with us uh, next week as well. And let me say this. While this week we're talking about worry and anxiety and depression, I don't expect to solve it in 35 minutes. I know. You're, some of you were hoping, like, that would be awesome. Uh, but I do expect that maybe we can get the conversation started. And if we get nothing else out of what happens in the rest of our time together, I hope that some of you who may be struggling would at least share this with somebody, like a friend, somebody you know is safe, like talk to somebody who, um, who you can just bear your soul with a little bit and let them know, hey, I'm, I'm struggling. It's okay to talk about this stuff, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this series. In fact, um, uh, John Hopkins Medicine came out, and they said that this last year, they said 26%, which is basically one in every four American adults from 18 and, and up, age 18 and up, uh, during the course of a year, deals with some kind of mental disorder, one out of four. Then they said 18%, which is almost one out of five Americans, 18 and older, deal with some kind of uh, anxiety disorder. So it could be PTSD, it could be C o OCD, it could be GAD. I was like, there's a bunch of them. And there's also like the list of phobias, like one out of five during the course of a year deal with that. So just to, just to know this, in, in a church where a little over a thousand people come on the weekend, several hundred of you, if we're close to the statistics at all, several hundred of you during the course of a year have had to deal with some of this stuff. And I would rather imagine that most of us, if it's not us, have someone close in our life who does. And so that's why we're talking about this stuff. That's why we're talking about it. In Psalm chapter 42, there's a lot said about, I think, worry and anxiety and depression. And so we're going to look at that whole chapter. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time. And I'm going to throw a couple of different verses in there. But let me give you what really is the key verse of the whole thing. This is Psalm 42, verse 5. He says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, and my God. Now, I'm just going to give us a heads up before we move on. When you know somebody is going through something and you want to give them Scripture, give them the Scripture in a way that it doesn't feel like a weapon. Okay, here, here's how some people would send this to somebody. I, I know you're, you're feeling down, but just put your hope in God. Yeah, yeah. You can snap out of it. Just put your hope in God. What do, you, what do you think? Are you crazy? Why are you all messed up? Just put your hope in God. That's it. simple. And as soon as we use Scripture like that, it doesn't really come across very helpful. We, we, we put them deeper in that depression or the anxiety they find themselves in already. So we're going to use the Word of God, but as a, in a way that encourages and comes alongside the way it's intended for us. And as we walk through, we're going to literally go back to our four buckets. If you missed last week, I encourage you to go watch that or listen to that on our podcast, but, but go back and listen to that. And, and we talked about four different buckets, you know, biological and situational, clinical, spiritual. We talked about these buckets. When we talk about mental health things, we've got to, we've got to clarify there are some different kind of categories we need to discuss. And so uh, the first one this week I want to look at is the biological. Here, here's what we know. Scientists have figured out, <laughs> let me say it this way, science is, is finally catching up on what God has said all along. 
Science is just figuring out how complex our brain really is. And that there's these chemicals that work in conjunction with our brain to make it healthy. If, if any of you uh, exercise on a regular basis, you probably have heard about or maybe even on your own, like studied about this thing that this chemical called in. Endorphins, yes. When you exercise, endorphins, this chemical is released in your brain, and it's a, it's, a, it's a chemical that brings pleasure and excitement and motivation, all these things, these positive things in our brain. And so when we, when we exercise, we know exercise is a key to all this stuff. When we exercise, there's actually a chemical reaction that happens in our brain that helps us. That's a pretty cool deal, right? Exercise is not the only way we get it. And here's why I say science is just now catching up with what God said all along. But check this out. Laughter. This is Harvard Health. Now, we know Harvard knows what they're talking about most of the time, unless you've watched the news this last year. Anyway, that's, that's a laughter thing. <laughs> laughter. A good belly laugh can do wonders for your state of mind, along with releasing endorphins. Laughter alters levels of serotonin and dopamine. Right? So here's what the Bible said in the book of Proverbs. Laughter is good medicine. Laughter is good for you. It literally, there is a chemical thing that happens in your brain when you laugh. So let me just get you started, right? A lawyer and a doctor and a rabbi walk into a bar. Ow! So anyway, okay. They walked into a bar. Okay, anyway, all right. So I'm just trying to help you guys out, right? Look at this one down here, dopamine. Another one of those chemicals, God wired us this way, one of these chemicals that works in our brain to bring pleasure and motivation, positive things. And then with all the bad things happening, uh, dopamine helps balance that out. That's what dopamine does for us. But did you know that there are things we can do that reduces the amount of this chemical called dopamine in our brain? There's things we can do. We can not get enough sleep. We can have really bad eating habits. We can use drugs. We can excessively consume alcohol. By the way, just a little side note, alcohol is a depressant. <laughs> so if you're struggling with depression and you're masking that and working with that and, and self-medicating with alcohol, you are not helping yourself right? So there's a whole bunch of things here. Uh, for example, um, again, exercise. So inactivity actually drains our dopamine. Here, here's one. I forgot to tell the last service. You guys get the bonus one. Uh, here's one that really struck me by surprise. All the ones in the list, are like, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Here was the last one. And, and it's okay. That baby's going to be okay in just a minute. Um, here's what they said drains our dopamine. Excess screen time. Just think about this, right? If you need sleep to be healthy, but you're not able to sleep, so you get on your phone and do this, you are draining the dopamine, one, by not getting enough sleep, and two, by excessive screen time. It's like you're not helping yourself, right? That's what it's saying. There, there are chemical things that happen in our brain. That's the way God wired us. Now, sometimes, like I said, there are some things that we may do that actually negate the, the, the positive things that could be happening because we're, we're draining our dopamine. But there are also chemical things that happen in our brain that may be genetic. Maybe it's passed down. And you're like, my life should be fine, and yet I'm struggling with this depression thing. That's like the story of my friend Lisa, really. Lisa goes to our church, and I sat down with her this week, and she shared her story, and I want to share it with you. So just watch this. So when I was in my late 20s, after I had my children, they were pretty young, babies and toddlers, um, I started to have serious depression. I uh, thought it, we thought it was like hormonal or postpartum, and it turned out to be more serious than that. But it took a couple years to be diagnosed with bipolar depression. I spent about 10 years trying to hide this because our culture doesn't understand mental health, mental illness, and it's, it's just real difficult to, to answer questions and deal with sort of the stereotypical view of mental health. I was raised a Christian, as, and one of the hardest things about the depression was that I felt a lot of guilt because I was told by someone I trusted that this depression was my sin and I caused it. And it's, that stayed with me for close to 30 years. I had a really blessed life, really supportive family and a supportive husband. 
So just the idea that I would get depressed just didn't make much sense to me. And when I finally did get a diagnosis, I pretty much refused to accept it. But the really worst part about it was because I felt that the depression was my sin, I felt blocked from God. I didn't even feel worthy of being able to pray for healing. One of the hardest things about depression is the distorted thinking that you have. When your brain is messed up like this, you, you believe everything it tells you. And that's why it was so easy to believe that it was my sin. The healing really came when I learned to trust and obey God. And after 20 or so years of not praying for healing, I did start to pray, pray for healing again. And uh, now I have no more symptoms, which I am really blessed because in, in now being obedient to God, I can allow him to use me. And I ended up changing careers from like an elementary school teacher to middle school. And I know now that that was to be in place, in a place where I think I was needed. And I found myself getting a lot of students in front of me that were facing these same kinds of things, depression and anxiety. So for about the last 10 years, maybe 15, um, everything that I do centers around my service to God in this ministry. So working with youth on Wednesday nights and uh, being with the girls and just trying to notice when I see the depression or the anxiety and I'm able to open up a conversation with them and share with them what I've gone through. It seems to have helped. I, I, I finally went all in with God in, in accepting that this is how he wanted to use me. And it was hard because when you spend so long trying to hide it, uh, it's hard to be that vulnerable and that open and honest with people. It is a spiritual battle, no matter what kind of depression it is, whether it's uh, chemical like mine or situational or trauma related, the spirit is always involved. And that's why it takes being with other people in some kind of supportive environment, friends or family or people with knowledge of depression to heal. And of course, God does the healing. God's ultimate love gift to us was his son uh, dying for us and his forgiveness is his gift to us all. And in that we are humbled and our service is an outpouring of that joy. I just can't say enough about how uh, wonderful it is to have that joy and have that forgiveness as a gift. Yeah. So blessed that Lisa was willing to share her story. And that, you know, there's, there's power in that. And I've, I've all weekend have heard from people who were touched by her story because it connected to theirs. And I think there's, that's another additional thing. It's like, not only do you need to talk to somebody, if, you, if you're struggling, it's like, you never know that when you talk to somebody else, that maybe that's going to also help them as you tell maybe some of the struggles that you've had. Well, back in Psalm 42, like we said, we're going to kind of work our way through the Psalm. Psalm 42, the first few verses say this, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? There's this, there's this distance that the psalmist writing feels from God. So in the Old Testament, we've talked about this before, for, for people to experience the presence of God, they had to be at the temple in Jerusalem. And apparently he's far away from that right now. And so he feels this, this like, like, a, like a deer pants for water. Man, I need like this, this experience, this presence of God. And I'm not at the temple and I want it so desperately. Like I want to be there. Remember what Lisa said? She said, because somebody told her it was all her fault, she felt distant from God, like there was a block. And some of you are there, like right now. Like you, you were literally, you would describe it this way. Like, like I, I made myself come to church today, and I'm glad I'm here, but man, I feel miles away from God. That's what our anxiety and worry and depression is going to speak into our life. God, though, says this, <laughs> I am not distant. I am close to the brokenhearted. 
That's what he says, Psalm 40, 34. I am close to the broken heart. He is right there. And it may feel like he's miles away, but the reality is he is not. He is with you. That's, that's the promise we get over and over in the Bible. In fact, and when we talk about Jesus, like Emmanuel at Christmas time, which means God with us. He is with us. And so in this biological bucket, sometimes it's maybe things that we've done to kind of mess up the chemistry in our brain, or sometimes it's maybe a genetic thing, or whatever it is, we, we still know that there is no distance. There doesn't have to be. But God wants to be right there with us. Next bucket is the situational bucket. This is just like the stuff that maybe sometimes just happens to us. Maybe in part it's, it's things we bring on ourselves, but it's, it's a lot of times the stuff that happens to us. Um, just last year, the Surgeon General came out with a thing in 2023. Surgeon General came out with something called the epidemic of our loneliness and isolation. Here's what he said. A review of 63 studies concluded that loneliness and social isolation among children and adolescents increased the risk of depression and anxiety, and that this risk remained high even up to nine years later. Just, just go back with me for the last four years. Schools are shut down. Everybody goes back to their own home. There's isolation. There's loneliness. And this study is revealing to us this could go on. The effects of this could go on for years. And you ask any teacher today who was a teacher before COVID, ask them, has the classroom dynamic changed? Have students changed? And they will just say, yes. Yes, it has. And so much of it has to do with the mental health of our students that was corrupted by isolation. This is not a political statement, by the way. Well, should we close school? I'm just telling you, by everybody being isolated, and this is true of adults, by everybody being isolated, there was, there was depression and suicide and those kind of things. They skyrocketed in statistics. We have to be aware that there are lasting effects of this stuff. And so sometimes the situation is just that. It's something that happened to us in our culture in this pandemic time. Look at this. These things I remembered as I pour out my soul, how I used to. So he's like remembering back. Remember how it used to be good, right? Anybody during 2020, 2021 just go, oh, I want to go back to what was normal, even though normal was like, uh, you know. Yeah, I, we remember back how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. One of, one of the things I hear from people, and I heard it again this morning, they say, I've been watching online, and I love the fact that we can do that. And then they get here, and they're like, wow. I, I couldn't get that. They don't even know how to describe it. I couldn't get that online. No, it's like, it's like being with God's people in God's presence. There's something going on there. And we're, we're loving the fact that if you're online, you're online and you're joining with us. But I'm just gonna tell, there's a different dynamic that happens when you're in the room. That's just true because we're not isolated and we, we need each other in the process. He's just remembering back. So maybe it's a, it's a loss like the, the loss of, of community and we were isolated. Maybe it's a, the loss of a loved one. Just remembering back what it was like when I had this person in my life. You know, it was my dad or my mom or maybe it was my spouse or my kids. Whatever it was, we were thinking back to what it was like. Whatever the situation is, the situation has changed. And now we find ourselves more worried and more anxious and more depressed because of that situation. Whatever the situation is, I will tell you this. God can still be in it. Corey Ten Boom, some of you might recognize that name, some of you may not. Corey Ten Boom lived through the Holocaust and was used by God in a mighty, mighty way to rescue some Jews who were being sought to be murdered by the Nazis, right? So she says this, I've experienced his presence, God's presence, in the deepest, darkest hell that men can create. You talk about bad situations, right? I've been, I've been there. I have tested the promises of the Bible, and believe me, you can count on them. Why? Because you can count on God. No matter how bad the situation is, God can still be present in that, and God can still deliver on his promises. That's what he will do. Another one of our big boxes is the clinical box. This is just to say that there are times when maybe things are so serious that just talking to a friend about it is not helping. And maybe there is a chemical imbalance. Maybe I need medication. I've always thought it interesting, right? When somebody breaks their leg, we don't just say, just have more faith and pray. We say, go to the doctor, get a cast. 
somebody has mental problems and we just say, no, just, just pray, just have more faith. Instead of saying, find a good doctor. And I think there are times we need to find a good Christian counselor, somebody who can help walk us through these things because it's beyond our ability to do it on our own. We need some help and that's okay. Let's go back to our key verse. Why, my soul, are you downcast? And why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. I mean, there's times we are so downcast, so disturbed, like we don't want to, and we, we were like incapable of taking the next step ourselves. That's what it feels like. And maybe we would rather just yell at the kids and kick the dog and watch another series on Netflix and use drugs and alcohol and sex to, to numb the pain, whatever. It's like the last thing we're going to do is do what we need to do that would actually help us. And that's why we need somebody to, on a professional level to guide us through all of that. Verse 6, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from the mountain of Zara. So he's just saying, it doesn't feel like it now. Remember, he feels distant, but he's like, but I remember what it's like to be with you. I, I know from experience how amazing you are. And sometimes you don't have that experience yet. That's the beauty of the Bible. We can see God at work in people's life, just, people just like us. We can see God at work in their lives, not perfect people, people who are broken, people who are sinners, people who mess up, we can see God at work in their life and we can get a track record and we can then say, okay, now I, I can see, I can remember what God has done in the past. And some of you have been walking with God long enough that even though you're in a bad time now, you remember when he was in your life in a way that reminded you he's capable of keeping his promises. Now, I want to jump out of Psalm 42 for a moment. Ephesians chapter 6 is where we get this whole picture of the armor of God we're supposed to put on. Here's two of them. He says, take the helmet of salvation. What does the helmet protect? Your brain. Not just your head. It protects your brain, right? So the helmet of salvation, the, the helmet, he says, this is part of the armor. It's going to protect your brain, your mind, and the sword of the Spirit. Now, again, earlier we said we're not going to use the Word of God like a weapon against somebody. No. The idea of the sword of the Spirit is that we use the Word of God as, as a weapon against our enemy, not on ourselves. Like, we're not supposed to turn the sword on ourselves. I, I read a great verse today, made me feel even more guilty. Eh. No, that's not how that works. Like it, it brings us to repentance and may, may convict us, but it brings us into the arms of the loving God, and that's what the Word does. So He protects our brain, but He also gives us a way to do battle against our enemy. Back to Psalm 42. Deep calls to deep in the roar. Everybody say roar. I'm going to come back to that. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Several years back, Michelle and I were up in Mammoth, and I wanted to go see Rainbow Falls. So I got my camera gear. I'm like, okay, baby, you ready to do this? And she's not seriously into hiking, but I had him do the one where they drop us off and we have to walk for miles. And then after the waterfall, we go up a hill and we have to hike some more. And then we get to a place with ice cream. That's how I got her. Anyway, so they drop us off here and we're walking. And you, you go past Devil's Post Pile and all this stuff. So you're, you're going, you're walking along the river. And then you get close and all of a sudden you begin to hear the waterfall. And then you get on the other side where you can see it. And now on this side, you can hear. The, it's like this thing is several feet high and it's crashing into the water. And there's a roar of a waterfall. Now, some of you have been up in, in Idlewild and you've come across the creek and there's a little waterfall. Now, that's not what we're talking about. Like if you've ever been to like Niagara Falls or Rainbow Falls or some big thing like that, it is a roar. And let me just tell you what he means. No matter how loud your circumstance is, God's promises are louder. He can speak over it. No matter how loud it is, he can still speak over that. He can still bring his hope into your situation. That's what he's saying. It's like the, the waterfall and more maybe the breaking of the ocean, the waves in the ocean, that, that can be loud. One time Michelle and I were in Hawaii. We were blessed with somebody who had a condo right on the water. It was like awesome. And they gave us this great deal. And we're like, yes, yes, yes. And we get back and they asked her, they said, did the waves keep you awake at night? <laughs> We're like, yeah. The breaker was happening like 20 feet from our door, our window. So we'd be like, okay, let's go. You know, yes, they were loud. No, God, his promise, his ability to be in the situation is even louder 
That's the promise. No matter how bad it is, God is bigger, God is stronger, and he keeps that promise. Now, here's what we, I, I want to do. Now, again, next week, Paul Alexander is going to be here. Paul has a, a podcast called Hope for the Broken Leader. And it's a, it's a prog- podcast largely for Christian leaders, like pastors and people in Christian ministry. Uh, because a lot of times, maybe we're the ones, we don't go get help. We think everybody thinks well, we've got it all together. So we, we don't know where to go. So he did a podcast. And I've been listening to this. It's some really good stuff. Several months back, he did one under pressure. And I listened to it again, getting close to this message. I just wanted to see some things he said. He came up with a list of nine things that we need to do. So clinical, this is a guy who knows what he's talking about, professional, saying, here are some steps you need to take. And I just wanted to pass these things on to you. Nine of them. Here's three. Number one, decide you're sick and tired. Hmm. He's just saying, first step is just to say, you know, I am, I'm done with this. I've lived like this for months or for like years. And, and here's what I've discovered with people. No matter how dysfunctional their life is, you show them how their life could be, and then they're like, yeah, but this is what I know. As dysfunctional as it is, this is what I know. If I go over there, that's scary because I don't know. Even though it could be way better, the unknown is like, I don't know about that, right? No, we need to just start right here and say, you know what? I don't want to keep living like this. I don't want to keep living like this. Number two, think baby steps. Anybody see What About Bob, the movie? (laughs) Richard Drivers and, and Bill Murray. Baby steps to the elevator, baby steps, you know. The point is actually good, though. Sometimes we're overwhelmed by how far we need to get. And he said, just, just figure out little steps you need to take. Let's say, for example, you know, exercise would be a good thing, right? Maybe your first step is to go get some decent hiking shoes or some decent running shoes. That's your first, that's just a little step. I know some of you, they'll, they'll stay in the box for months, but at least you took that one step, right? You went and got something, right? Take the baby steps. Number three, get a physical and do the blood work. When you go get a physical, this is what they do. They, they run your blood and they do a test. And then here's what they can see. They, they can see sometimes if you're iron deficient. And maybe that's why you're so sluggish. Like sometimes just your blood work will be able to reveal something that's going on. And then there's chemically, there's a way they can fix that, right? So get a physical. Number four, evaluate your diet. Eating junk food all the time is not going to help your depression or your anxiety. In fact, look here. Carbs and alcohol. I'm just going to talk about this one for a second. I'm just going to be really honest with you. If you give me a celery stick and a cinnamon scone, the celery is gone. It's like, it's not, I don't care. Like, I want the scone. Like, I want the maple bar. I, I love bread. Does anybody else just love bread? Bread, like, speaks to our heart. Carbs. There's, there's a crash after that joyous moment, right? There's a crash that's coming. Alcohol, what did we say earlier? It's a what? It's a depressant. And so the mo- look at your diet because what you're eating may directly affect your mental health. Number five, pray, journal, talk to others. So the whole thing is about getting our emotions out there, right? So we're going we're gonna to talk to somebody. We're going to pray. We're, we're going to write it down. It's like we're just starting the process. This is a little step, but we're going to start the process, like we said earlier, of at least talking to somebody and just saying, things aren't going so good. This is how I feel, All right? Number six, pray for power and courage. There, there was a couple of things in his list I didn't see in anybody else's list. And I, I looked at a lot of stuff in the last couple of weeks. Nobody else said this. He says, we typically pray, are you ready? We typically pray for peace and comfort. He says, but that's not what you need. What you need is power and courage. You need God's help. You need the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead to give you the power and the courage to take the next step so you can go from the old life to the new life. Like you're going to need help, but you're going to need power and courage to get there. Number seven, alcohol. Oh, have I mentioned alcohol yet? It's a what? Depressant. Depressant. I know alcohol is a big deal in our culture. It's the way we socialize. It's, it's so much of what we do. But it could be the very thing that's keeping you from having a good day. It masks the problem. It never fixes it. Number eight, find a safe person. I'm just going to keep saying this. 
That, that, that person might be in your life group, might be in your rooted group, might be in your CR. That, say, that person might be on your change maker team. That person might be somebody in your row right now. I don't know who it is, but find somebody you can just say, hey, everything's not okay. Would you pray for me? Get the conversation, get that stuff out there. And then the ninth one is another one I didn't see on anybody else's list. Walk with Scripture. Now, the walk is exercise. Like, we need exercise, right? So, um, I tell people all the time, like, I love mountain biking. And uh, the one thing I love about it, besides being like this adrenaline rush, like endorphins go, like, because I'm pushing my heart and my lungs to the max to get up that hill. Just over here at Simpson, just to get up that hill is a lot of work. Coming down is a lot of fun. Unless you see snakes. Ow, I hate those things. So, and that's another thing that happens to your brain when you see a snake. I squeal like a little girl. Anyway, uh, he's saying they'll walk with Scripture. Here's what I say to people about mountain biking. For me, it's not just physical. It's spiritual. It's a spiritual thing for me. And I love riding with my friends, but I also like going by myself because to get from my house to the top of the hill takes a lot longer than to come down. And so as I'm going up, that's my time to think and my time to pray and my time to just kind of consider what God's wanting to do. It's like if you, if you have that verse, right? So we talk about every day with Jesus. We, we're going to read our Bible. Maybe we just read one verse. Maybe we read a chapter, but there's one verse that jumps out. Just like screenshot on your phone and go for a walk. And just kind of keep looking at it. Read through it again. Think about it. Like walk with Scripture. Exercise. You need the exercise. But have God walk with you. I, lo I love that picture. How helpful that can actually be for all of us, right? So those are all big buckets. And then the one bucket that kind of encapsulates everything is spiritual. Like everything's spiritual. Everything. God says, you know, I don't want you to have like a marriage bucket and a work bucket and a family bucket and a recreation bucket. And then, oh, yeah, a little bucket for God over there. No, like he is in everything. Everything's spiritual. Everything's spiritual. Look at this. I say to God, my rock. Just keep that perspective when your world is shaking, right? He is our rock. Why have you forgotten me? That's what it feels like. He's just getting it out. I, I love how the Psalms just like share their feelings. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony. My foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. I love this word right here. It's kind of like, I know things are bad, except, I, I know things are, but, I, I know things, yet, I'm going to still praise you, because you're my rock. Everything else is moving and shaking, but you are consistent, you are faithful, and I'm going to hang on to you with everything I got. That's what he's saying right there. Max Lucado talking about anxiety and worry and depression. He says, so much of what we worry about actually is perceived chaos. That's the phrase he used, perceived chaos. And here's what I think he means by that. You don't have to raise your hand, and please don't point at anyone else near you. But is anybody watching online? Is anybody in the house here? Is anybody a worst case scenario person, right? Like, don't point, all right? But it's like something happens, like, oh no, probably going to and like, how did you get there so fast, right? We're probably all going to die. It's just a long line at in and out right? It's like, yeah, but the lines are so long, we'll probably starve to death. Like, yeah. Worst case scenario. And then he says this. I like this. Peace is within reach. Not for lack of problems. <laughs> we, we got our share. But because of the presence of a sovereign Lord. Philippians chapter 4 says, we can have this peace that passes all understanding. Why? Because the Lord is near. Again, over and over, the promise is He is with us. He's close to the brokenhearted. He is with us. Like, we have His presence. Whatever is going on, no matter how bad it is, no matter how many problems we have, we still have our rock. We still have our sovereign Lord. I'm going I'm to jump to one other verse and then kind of head towards landing. Some of you are like, finally. All right. Galatians chapter 3 says this. So in Christ, pay attention to the language. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have 
clothed yourselves with Christ. I'm just going to tell you, he says the same thing three times. He just says it in different ways. This is not a trick question. Let me just ask you this. When you put on your clothes today, were you then in your clothes? Yep, I'm in there. You clothe yourself. You are in Christ. He's talking about relationship here. In Christ, baptized into Christ, clothed meaning in Christ. He goes, this, this is who we are. Now, by the way, we've had these 98 people who've made that decision this year, and we are celebrating with every single one of them because it's the old has become new, right? So, so in Christ, there are so many good things that are happening. In Christ, I just want to share with you some thoughts uh, that I came across, and I, I want to pass them on to you, all right? So when I point at you, you're going to say, in Christ. In Christ. All right, that's fairly weak, but we're going to go with it. Here we go. We have freedom, innocence, grace upon grace, redemption, and the righteousness of God. We have Heavenly Father, a selfless Son, a Holy Spirit, and billions of brothers and sisters. No condemnation, new birth, new life, new creation, new mind, new heart, new nature, new covenant, new spirit that rose Christ from the dead, then placed you in a new family and sealed you with a new destiny. Chosen, saved, accepted, and adopted. You have been consecrated, liberated, initiated, supplied, anointed, purified, sanctified, and justified. You have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Wisdom, knowledge, vision, imagination, creativity, focus, and purpose. The mission of God, the meaning of life, and the mystery of the gospel. You've been made alive, made new, made steadfast, made one, and made grateful. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The veil has been lifted and torn. The distance has been narrowed. The ransom has been paid. The trespass has been canceled. The the chains have been broken. Praise God. You have been given power, victory, triumph, strength, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, immeasurable riches In in Christ. In Christ. That's what we have. So I'm going to pray for you, but we're not done. I got one more thing after our prayer. It's so important for our church family. I want to share something with you, but let me pray. God, we just thank you that we are in you, covered, protected, and we have your power and your help. God, I just want to, I just want to ask on anybody here who's struggling that they could find somebody to talk to and just tell them, I'm not Okay because we can't do this on our own. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to our rescue. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. All right, so I asked them up here for a reason, and here's the cool, here's the cool news, all right? So we've been tracking for the last several months what's been going on in our church and, and attendance and our growth and everything, and we have recognized something that maybe you can recognize. Just look around. It's full again, right? So... One month, one month from this weekend, we're going to go to three services on Sunday mornings, all right? That's to make more room for more people, and those times are going to be 8, 9, 30, and 11. Don't go to the 9, 30. All right, so 8, 9, 30, and 11. That's, that's our new times. For those of you at this 1045 service, you think it's an 11 o'clock service, so don't change anything. Just keep coming at 11. You're good, all right? All right, so... I said that right. Okay. I didn't have to tell the other services that, but you, I needed to tell that too, right? So here's the thing. I asked them to come up here because we're going to need help. In a month from now, we're going to three services. We're going to need more people at the tech and then the host team and the cafe and like greeting, all those things, especially in our children's ministry. Here's a couple of cool things. In, In our kids' ministry from birth to fifth grade that happened on Thursday night and on Sundays, This year, we've already had 85 first-time families this year check in kids to our kids' ministry. Yeah. And that calculates to over 190 first-time kids who've shown up in just the last three months. So that's, God's doing something really cool right there, right? So going to three services, we're going to need more people in all those areas. And, and even though we need them in all the areas, this is the area that takes the longest to get ready to go because there's a background check. We care about our kids, and you've got to be background checked. So this is Pastor Donnie. He's our family pastor. In case you don't know, Pastor Donnie. 
This is Nicole. She's one of our admin, but she also oversees everything on the weekends from birth to kindergarten. Okay, this is Nicole. And a newest member of our staff. He just started last week, all right? This is Adrian Rojas. Would you please welcome Adrian Rojas? He is our elementary director for all of our weekend stuff. And so these guys right here are the ones you need to talk to if this is an area you'd like to help with. And we want to make sure you get started like now in that process because there is a background check. Like we said, there's a fingerprinting thing. Um, And let me just say, if you're not going to pass the background check, it's it's okay. Find another place to serve. And if you don't like kids, (laughs) do not serve there. All right? Don't, don't, don't go there, right? You guys can go so you can get back and be ready. They're going to be out there. And if you want to talk to them right afterwards, please go talk to them and get that started. But here's the thing. Right after I'm done, I'm going to dismiss you in just a minute. I want you to go back. I don't, if you want to help with tech, go back to Sean's right in the middle. Wave your hand, Sean. Sean's right in the middle back there. You can go back to Beverly's back here. And she's going to be out there. You can talk to her about being a greeter, being an usher, helping with that kind of stuff. We'll have people in the cafe. You can go talk to them. Say, hey, I want to help in the cafe. We have people who literally come early on Thursday night to help people eat. And you're like, man, I could, I could do that. Like I could come and help cook or help set it up or help clean up or whatever. You want to come back on a Thursday night, you can do that. Or if you can help on Sunday and one of those three services that's going to be happening, we, we want to encourage you to go and get those conversations started now. Now here's what I know as a, for a fact. I've just told a whole bunch of people this weekend we need help. And you're going to look around going, yeah, they got that covered. Because you're thinking somebody else, surely, don't call me surely, somebody else is going to do this, right? So here's what I'm going to ask. All of you who are already change makers, you volunteer in one of our areas, we call you change makers. I'm going to ask you to go get a friend and get them plugged into your team, right? I need you to do that because I'm going to just say we need help. And a lot of people are going to go, yeah, they, they got enough people, they'll get it covered. No, I need need you to help. In fact, if you're one of our change makers in any area, just stand up for a second. If you volunteer in any area in our church family, all right? Yeah, thank you guys. So if you have a question about their area, go ask them afterwards, all right? Now get out of here. Leave. Go talk to somebody about serving. Love you. See you next week. that we call our home And one day we'll see you face to face With angels and saints we'll sing your praise And worship the name
Father, open my eyes, fill my heart with your light. You make me come alive. I wanna know you more. Father, open my eyes, fill my heart with your light. You make me come alive. I wanna know you more. Me to discover you, you are your son, your perfect mystery. You are more than the human mind could ever hope to comprehend. Still, you're calling me out into the ocean of your endless peace. So we see.